You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome yet to another episode of the Nailed It Ortho podcast. I'm one of the hosts, Dr. Cole, myself, and Dr. started this podcast to go over high yield orthopedic surgery topics. And I'm looking forward to today's episode. We're going to talk a little bit, at least on foot and ankle, because we haven't had foot and, a lot of foot and ankle on here. And we're going to talk a little, a little bit about flat foot today or posterior tibialis deficiency or however you want to say it. There are many different terms. And we have none other than Dr. Lauren Ganey coming to speak about us, uh, speak about flat foot and a little bit more about her. She did her residency at the Yukon School of Medicine. Uh, she also did her fellowship in foot and ankle at the Mercy Medical Center. And so I am looking forward to this talk. So Dr. Gang, welcome to the Nail It Ortho podcast. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, of course. And, you know, again, thank you for coming on. And what we typically start do is we start off the episode asking a couple of questions, just getting to know you, and then we will jump into the topic of the day. So the age old question is what made you foot and ankle out of all of the specialties that you could have gotten? Yeah, great question. So you know, as most people do, I, I went into orthopedics, fairly open mind, not quite sure, you know, what avenue I wanted to go to. And, you know, one of the things, uh, a few things drew me to foot and ankle surgery. The first thing is thought is that I thought it was really challenging. And I thought it was important for me um, to continue to be challenged throughout my career. And I, I kind of, honestly, I wanted something that I didn't really understand, you know, as a resident, so that it, I thought it was something that was complex enough um, that it would continue to challenge me. And I thought it was exciting and that, you know, there's a lot we don't know. And I think in the world of ortho and, and all the different specialties, I, I think, you know, we're kind of on the earlier side as far as uh, foot goes and, and we're still learning so much about it. So, you know, I, I liked that. I liked the variety, um, you know, being specialized, but not doing the same surgery repetitively. You know, I can go you know, weeks without repeating the same surgery necessarily. So, you know, those were two of the things that really drew me to it. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I'm actually on foot and ankle right now and starting to do some more procedures and, you know, seeing the wide breadth of things you can do. You can do some trauma stuff as, you know, the bread and butter foot and ankle cases. So for those listening who there, because sometimes we have some medicines as well, some residents that listen. And I think all these little tidbits of why people chose their fields um, may play a part. Oh. Maybe, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but hopefully people will gather some good, uh, good perspective from that. And moving on, next question I have for you is kind of a general question, but for those that are fellows that are listening to this, that are just finishing up their fellowship, about to start into their own practice, starting a foot and ankle practice, what advice would you give to those that are just starting off practice? So one of the best pieces of advice I got um, from actually my fellowship and what I try to pass on to my residents is when you first start, start by overbooking all your cases because you don't realize how long something takes until you're doing it on your own and you don't have the attending, uh, putting everything, you know, putting all the retractors where they should go. You don't realize how hard it is to use a mini arm until you're on your own. Um, the last thing you need is more stress. So, you know, one of the things I did and was told to me, just overbook everything, expect everything to take longer. It's so much less stress starting out and just take your time doing everything. Um, you know, that was a really good piece of advice. Um, and the other, thing, which I think that really carries throughout all of residency and, you know, any practice you're in is, is really to, to treat the staff well, um, because I think you notice it even more when you're working with the same people over and over, but morale is huge, you know, and, and staff morale and, and how, you know, just treating people like you would your own family, you know, your patients, your, your coworkers, um, the people who work with you, it's just so important just because unlike residency where you get to change things every few months, you're kind of stuck with it for a while. Um, so these are people that, that turn into your family, just like your other co-residents do in residency. Yeah, I totally think is solid advice. And I know today, I actually did a, uh, I was doing an MTP fusion with my attending and he, and he, he stood there and, and pretty much walked me through it. And we've done plenty of them together before, but I was the main one doing it. And I, and, you know, you don't really realize those, those small, minute detail, details, like where women retractors go, uh, you know, how, how do you, you know, elevate the capsule or whatever it may be. 
until you're doing it yourself. So I, I totally attest to that. And everything looks like a nerve experience. when you're doing it on your own, right? <laughs> yeah. Why are you going so slow? I, I'm like, I, you know, I'm just super, super careful. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, definitely love that tidbit about, you know, making sure that you have keeping the morale up and being nice to everybody is a for sure way to at least try to make things a little bit easier. And last question, and this is a question we have not asked on this podcast before, but I'm interested to see what the answer may be is what books, if you have any, that have you gifted most to people? So that's told a good people question. to read or whatever. <laughs> So, you know, I think that the, the one that I reference the most and, and that I encourage my residents to read uh, with respect to the foot and ankle is the, the man textbook. It was given to me early on. Um, and I think that's a great reference. Um, it goes through cases. It has good background. So in, in the world of uh, orthopedic surgery in my residence, in the world of parenthood and being a mother, the book that I love to give new mothers, especially those with young girls, is called Zog and the Flying Doctors, and it's about a princess who becomes a doctor, and that princesses can be doctors too. So that's a, a favorite for kids. I love it. Two great <laughs> suggestions. I have not read the, the latter. Well, I don't think I've read either of them, but I will definitely check them out or refer people to them. Uh, so perfect. Well, let's go on and move on and talk a little bit about Flatfoot today. So Dr. Ganey, say for example, you know, you have a, a 50 year old um, lady with of diabetes who comes into your office, just kind of complaining of lateral sided foot pain. And they were referred to you, their primary care physician, because they're concerned that they had flat foot. And I know we'll get into the physical exam findings and everything in a bit. First, just wanted to see if we can kind of just touch on some of whatever the pertinent anatomy you think may be behind flat foot and, and things to understand in this, you know, disease or this spectrum. Yeah. So, you know, I think flat foot is a great thing to talk about because I think there's so many different components to it. And, and we'll go into that, you know, later, especially when we talk about ways to fix it, but it's not just a single plane deformity. You know, even we talk about pronation, we're talking about hind foot alignment, we're talking about what the forefoot is doing secondarily. So it's it's very complex. And, and as we know, you know, most adult acquired flat foot's coming from, you know, posterior tibial tendon insufficiency. Um, you know, and the posterior tibial tendon is particularly at risk um, for a lot of reasons. One, just like all tendons, right? We talk about the watershed area, whether it's the shoulder and the supraspinatus, whether it's the Achilles. And so, you know, for two reasons, both that the posterior tibial tendon has that watershed area around the medial mal, but it's kind of getting a double hit because it's also going around a bend there. So there's some friction that occurs um, as well. And so both of those things kind of contribute to why the posterior tibial tendon starts to wear down. And, you know, we will, again, I'm sure we'll go into the classification later, but I, I think it's important to understand it. And, you know, what I guess I didn't appreciate until I got into fellowship in practice is that most people that come to you with, you know, progressive collapse of the foot with posterior tibial tendon pain, um, or, you know, that lateral sided pain, as you're referring to, I'd say most of them started out with some degree of a flat foot. So you often see that, yeah, they have flat feet bilaterally, but the side that's symptomatic is much more deformed. And so it's almost like they've been walking around their whole life at a mechanical disadvantage. And eventually that posterior tip just kind of gives up and starts to, to uh, wear down. And so, you know, I, I think that, again, the anatomy is complex. The posterior tibial tendon is at risk for those two issues. Um, and because of that, it kind of just starts, you know, this cascade of events. And so what, well, I guess what function does the, does the tendon itself have? You know, I always, you know, hear that it can help, you know, with medial art support, but, but what, what is the function of the posterior yeah. tibialis tendon? So, I mean, specifically it inverts, um, you know, secondarily it, it plantar flexes, but primarily it, it inverts and supinates the foot. But the reason mechanically, you know, that's important, and this kind of gets the whole gait cycle, 
is we talk about, you know, the foot position and its relation, you know, to those transverse tarsal joints and what that does. So when you invert the hind foot, um, what that does is that it locks that transverse tarsal joint. So it essentially gives you a stiff uh, lever arm in order to push off on. So that's why it's important in the gait cycles because it, it gives you a stiff lever arm, which helps you with push off. Okay. And, and we're talking about where does it insert just, just for anatomy, for those that are just, just wearing, you know, yeah, so <laughs> where does it insert? everywhere. <laughs> so it's more important <laughs> where it does much. insert, you know, I think okay. that's the easier thing to remember <laughs> is that, I mean, it really, other than the first metatarsal essentially, and you know, the talus, I mean, it's really, so it's really pretty extensive. We talk about primarily the one we always, you know, refer to and accessory navicular, et cetera, is that medial uh, navicular tuberosity, but it also extends plantarly and wraps around the plantar aspect of the foot. It attaches the, to the uh, cuneiforms. It attaches to the second through fifth metatarsals. And so it has this really broad attachment plantarly to help again, support that arch. Okay. And so when you talked about the posterior tibialis function, you, you mentioned, I'm just, just repeating that in order, normally that posterior tibialis tendon helps lock the transverse, um, uh, the transverse, uh, I'm blanking, the tarsal, tarsal joints, yeah. the tarsal joints, and that gives you that stiff lever arm in order to like, continue through, through gait, correct? Correct. And okay, so when you have, I guess, dysfunction of the tendon, what's kind of the, the physiology, like how, what is, what are the changes that happen to the foot? With right. Posterior? So, right. So a few different things. Um, so when it stops functioning, um, then a couple things different happen. So it, eventually what happens is that the hind foot goes into some valgus because you don't have the posterior tib um, to invert the foot. So the hind foot um, starts to go into valgus. You also lose some of the medial support with that. So the foot can go uh, also into abduction. Um, and again, you know, there are a couple different things that can happen uh, in, in order to compensate secondarily. So if your hind foot goes into valgus, then in order for your foot to, to stay flat on the ground, and, and this gets confusing, your forefoot has to then supinate to keep your foot plantar grade. So, it, you know, that forefoot has to adjust to what the hind foot is doing. Um, it, and so the hind foot starts to go into valgus, the forefoot has to correct. And again, sometimes you get that, also that abduction deformity uh, through the midfoot as well. Okay, so we get, uh, just repeating, we get our hind foot that goes into um, valgus. And then in order to, you know, I mean, keep that keep that stance, your forefoot supinates, but it can also abduct as well. Is that correct? Correct, yep. And how often, because I, you know, you read about it and you'll see like, you know, eventually they, with increasing valgus, the fibula will go and impinge and they can get lateral ankle pain. Do yeah. you see that often in clinic? Like, is that something, do you ever yeah. see it get to that point? I do. And, and it's interesting because, you know, and just like it's described, often they'll start with the medial sided pain and whether it just eventually kind of gives up uh, or what, you know, the, the medial side tends to dissipate with time. Um, and then often they'll start presenting to you with lateral sided pain. And, you know, what I find is that lateral pain can actually be from two areas. You know, the thing that, I think the thing we talk about a lot is the subfibular impingement, meaning that the calcaneus as it goes into valgus, then, you know, pinches against the lateral, um, the fibula and, you know, the perineal tendons that are running right below that. But I think what I see honestly more frequently um, is kind of a sinus tarsi impingement. So if you think about the lateral process of the talus, you know, it's that sharp point. And essentially what happens is that, you know, as the foot goes into valgus, that edge almost starts to, um, to impinge in the angle of gassain. And so a lot of people will have sinus tarsi pain uh, and or that fibular impingement pain. And even to the point where I've seen people with fibular stress fractures, you know, it's putting so much torque oh, on really? the fibula, they get a, a stress fracture a little bit, you know, like a Weber C kind of transverse issue there. Oh, wow. wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, that, no, that's pretty cool. Well, I mean, that's not cool, but yeah, it's good to know. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, <good> to <laughs> yeah it's it. interesting. That's what I was, that's what I was trying to think <laughs> of. And so what role does the, does the Achilles have to, like, what, what part does that play in this, um, you know, in this, in the pathophysiology of, of, you know, this, this disease? Yeah. 
Well, you know, and the question is what comes first, right? You know, and, and I would yeah. argue that most people, you know, over 15 have a tight gastroc, um, you know, other than those that, that stretch, stretch regularly. But, you know, what happens is that as the calcaneus goes into valgus, the distance right from the origin to the insertion of the gastroc gets shorter because the calc moves laterally. And so, you know, inevitably the, the gastroc is going to shorten. So it does that. The other thing that happens, and this goes back to what we talked about uh, earlier with the fact that the posterior tibial tendon, when it works, is inverting right through the tail navicular and the CC joints, and it's locking it in. So when it's not working, that whole midfoot's essentially unlocked. So what happens is, is that you get some dorsiflexion through those transverse tarsal joints. And so you get this compensatory dorsiflexion through the midfoot. So again, it means that the gastroc and the Achilles doesn't have to work as hard because you're getting dorsiflexion through the forefoot. So it kind of compensates for it as well. Oh, okay. No, yeah, that, that makes that makes perfect sense. And uh, I love how you broke it down like that. It took me a while to read and like sit and look <laughs> at it to understand it, but then you just broke it down so clearly. Um, yeah, that's, the way that's, I that's always remember it. Yeah, locked in. Just remember locked in, right? In inversion, it's locked. That that's how I remembered it as a resident. And I, I pass that on because that's an easy way to remember it. That is a gem by Dr. Ganey. <laughs> um, so continuing forward. So what I get well, I, let me just review real quick. So again, we said that our you know our, our posterior tibialis normally helps lock those that transverse tarsal joint and that helps with stance. But when we have dysfunction of that tendon, that arch collapses. Um, you start to get some uh, valgus in your in your hind foot, your forefoot supinates as well as abducts a little bit. And if it gets worse and worse, you could end up having kind of sinus tarsi slash lateral, you know, lateral ankle pain. Um, so what patients get flat foot? Like, is there etiology is more common in any any patients in general or I know in your practice that you've seen? Yeah, so, you know, it, it tends to be kind of older patients, um, you know, patients with diabetes certainly have a higher risk for it. patients with obesity, you know, an interesting one that you don't really think about necessarily is hypertension. Um, I, and I can't give you a great reason why that is, but studies have shown that that has an, an association with it as well. Females tend to have a little bit higher predisposition uh, as well. And so, you know, there are certain people that, that tend to, you know, have a higher risk for it. That being said, you know, you tend to kind of see it all over the place. And so say, you know, Dr. Ganey, we had, you know, this, for example, at the beginning, we had this 40 year old female history of diabetes came to your clinic and, you know, referred because of foot pain and with a concern for flat foot from the primary care physician. So when you're getting a history and doing a physical exam on these patients, what are you asking and what, like, what kind of information are you getting from them and the history part? And we can kind of jump to the physical exam part and what are some of the important things to look for? Right. So, you know, I, I think kind of the progression of it's important, you know, and, and like we talked about, not that it necessarily matters as much for management, but I always ask them, have you always had flat feet? Some people honestly are, su are surprised when they come up with the flattest feet you've ever seen. And you mentioned it, it's like, nobody's ever told them that. And you feel like you're <laughs> breaking something really bad. To them. Right, so, the news yeah, I know. Like you've never noticed that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that you want to know the progression, you know, was it traumatic, which it tends to not be right. I mean, in, in your classic patient that you described, I mean, for the most part, you're just going to hear a gradual progression, you know, worsening pain, you know, you can ask about where did it start, right? Because somebody that comes in with a flat foot and swelling and posterior medial pain, I mean, right away, your head is going to posterior tibial tendonitis. When they come in with lateral pain, you know, it's a little more circuitous to get to that diagnosis because you're thinking, you know, you have a much bigger differential there. You're thinking perineals, you're thinking, you know, a lot of different, you know, issues going on, on the lateral side of the ankle, chronic ankle sprains, you know, et cetera. And so, you know, I think kind of understanding the progression, a lot of them will have had preceding medial pain or, oh yeah, I also have pain on the medial side but the majority of it now is lateral. And so most of them will have a combination um, if it is due to um, the lateral impingement. And so those are questions that I tend, tend to ask them, obviously, what have they done for it? Most of them, if they've done anything, has been fairly uh, minimal. Okay. And then, so when you, you know, you've gotten your, your um, you know, they've told you, yeah, it's mostly medial sided pain. 
um, nothing on the ladder right now. Then when you're examining these patients, what are some things that you look for? Um, or how so, do you how do you do your physical exam? Yeah, so you know my my general physical exam, I always first have them stand up for me. There you go. So you're looking at them both symmetrically. Um, and again, you know, often you'll see that one side has some hind foot valgus and it's asymmetric. So when I'm dictating, I say, you know, normal person, I'll say physiologic hind foot valgus, or in someone like this, I'll say bilateral hind foot valgus worse on the left than on the right, you know? And so I'm trying to describe, you know, where they are at baseline and kind of where they've, where they've gone to, you know, you'll try to have them do a, a heel raise. Most of them can't do it. And be careful because if you're in a, um, in, in an exam room and there's the, the table that they've been sitting on, a lot of times they're going to use their hands to help push them up. So you may want to have them go against the like, wall. Um, yeah, I mean, they don't really, you yeah. know, they've been compensated for so long with some right. are intentionally trying to fool you, but they're trying, you know, they're trying to do what you ask. And so have them against a wall sometimes so they can kind of put their hands on it for balance, but they're, you know, they can't cheat. Um, you know, I usually, you know, again, most of these, you know, if you have that patient, the diabetic, I'm sure obese, you know, 40 something year old patient, I have them go up on both sides first. If they can do that, then I'll have them do a single leg heel raise. Um, but you also don't want them to, to fall in your office. So, right. um, so I'll have them do bilateral first. If they're able to do it, I'll have them attempt a single leg heel raise. You know, we talk about you know, this idea of does their, does their arch correct when they do a single like heel raise? And that can be a hard thing to tell. You know, the things I'm looking for is number one, can they initiate a heel rise? And number two, does it hurt? Because I think that that really helps you focus in your exam, you know, bonus, if you could tell if their hind foot corrects or not, but that's a hard thing to see. Um, I was going to say, what, what info would you get if, if it, if it does, you know, recon, if the arch does reconstitute, it does reconstitute. Kind of yeah, so it, I mean, it tells you that the posterior tip is functioning the way it should. So, you know, there's okay. a progression of it's painful, but functioning to it's painful and it stopped working, you know? Mm, okay. And so that those are the things, I mean, the things about, you know, whether it's rigid or not, I, you're going to get that, I think, better just on your exam when you're, when you're testing the subtalar motion, you're going to know if it corrects or not just by, you know, trying to correct that hind foot. Yeah, and, and and go ahead. What what you were uh, what you were saying as far as the rest of your exam? Yeah, so range of motion and what's really important um, when you're looking at ankle range of motion is that you have to, at least in the flexible patient, um, correct the hind foot when you're checking their Achilles because you have to reduce the hind foot where it's supposed to be. And you know, 99 out of 100 times they're going to have a very very tight gastroc. Um, and so you want to do the silver scold, right, which is when you test dorsiflexion with the knee extended and the knee flexed. And if it's a change, then it isolates the contracture to the gastroc versus the Achilles. And when you say you bring the, the heel back to neutral, are you just not like not in, are you just inverting the heel or just kind of essentially? Yeah, take so the I, I cup out? The, exactly. So I, I cup the heel and I reduce the, the heel underneath the tibia when I'm doing it. Okay. And then, so if, uh, let me think about it. So if you do, if you do the exam, right. So if you, yeah. if you have the, the, uh, the knee fully extended and it's tight and you flex it up and it's still tight, then that's going to be due to your soleus versus if it is, or do I have it backwards? I'm trying to no, think. no, you're right. So it's a kill, right. So you think about where, right. So the gastroc and the gastroc and the soleus come together to form the Achilles, just like you said, and the soleus does not cross two joints, right? So if Correct. there's no change, then it's the Achilles complex, the soleus and the gastroc. If there is a change. So when you dorsiflex, when you bend the knee, you're essentially taking the gastroc out of the equation because you're taking away that proximal origin, right? So you're loosening the gastroc. So if that contracture, if the if the tightness goes away when you flex the knee, then it isolates it to the gastroc as being tight. Okay, and and a subtalar motion. I heard you say something about that earlier. Yeah. You just you just invert and evert. Exactly, the, the and heel. so yeah, exactly. And what you want to do, it's important. I always dorsiflex the ankle when I'm doing that because I think it gets sloppy otherwise and it's hard to isolate subtalar joint versus, you know, 
you know, all the other joints throughout the, you know, the transverse tarsal and the midfoot. And so I always dorsiflex in order to stabilize the other joints when I am testing the subtalar motion. Okay. And just to review, so when you're doing this exam, all these patients are barefoot. And when you're ex Correct. examining them at first, you're looking at them from behind and you're checking their valgus. You're checking to see uh, if you can see too many toes. I've heard that before, the too, too yeah. many toes sign as well. That just yes. kind of shows you that the forefoot is abducted a little bit more. Correct. Yep. So what are, I guess is moving on, what would be some things that you would see on radiographs, on x-rays that would point mm -hmm. out to you, you know, that this is a flat foot? Right. So a lot of different angles that people talk about. I would say the ones that, that I use most. So I really use th probably three different things the most. So on the lateral view, I use the um, Miri's angle, right? Or the talus first metatarsal angle. And so that's uh, looking at that angle between, you know, the tailor axis and the first metatarsal axis. And really is anything normal, you know, as close to zero as possible, but anything from zero to 10 really is considered normal. Um, but you're looking at really any sag throughout the, the midfoot. So, so that's looking at that, that pronation that claps throughout the midfoot. And, and I think that that's really helpful as far as lateral x-rays. People talk about the cuboid height. They talk about it at different angles, but I think that's the one in my practice that I think is the most consistent. And, you know, the thing that I use the most on the lateral image. Okay. Um, on the AP view, um, you can also talk about the same details, first mid tarsal angle. The thing that I like the most and, and the reason I use this is because it's most helpful for me in surgical planning, but I look at how much uncoverage of the tail or head. So essentially, if you think about the navicular as supposed to be completely covering the tail or head, right? So as the foot goes into abduction, that tail or head becomes more exposed. And so really the, the magic number is about 30 to 35% of the tail or head. So, you know, and that's how do we differentiate, you know, the, the 2A from the 2B um, when it comes to the classification um, and that kind of helps dictate surgical planning. So I think those are, are two of the, you know, things that I really focus on. If you have the ability, there's something that we call the Saltzman view or the hind foot alignment view, which can be helpful um, where you can actually do an x-ray of the standing alignment and you can see where the heel is positioned, uh, which is helpful. I think, especially, you know, some of your bigger patients that it may be hard to really see how much hind foot valgus they have. That's awesome. And I think you actually transitioned yourself into what I was going to ask you next <laughs> about the classification systems. Yeah. <laughs> so how do this we classify this? This is a great this? paper. If you guys ever read this paper, it's, it's actually very entertaining. So it's a really good, easy paper to read. So I'd recommend it. But, um, you know, it's interesting. So we talk about staging classifications and the best ones dictate management, which I, I think this one does. Um, my, the criticism of it is that, you know, this suggests that stage one becomes stage two, becomes stage three, becomes stage four. And that's not necessarily the case. So just some kind of pearls, you can have ankle malalignment with a supple foot. So these are, you always want to consider the ankle in all of these. Um, and the other thing I would say, so we talk about stage one is really being like an isolated tenosynovitis, um, with normal alignment. And the person that you're really going to tend to see that in and you want to be really concerned about is in your rheumatoid patient or anyone with a, you know, seronegative arthropathy, because that can be very aggressive. So that needs to be something that, that you look at. If it's, you know, somebody that had some sort of injury, a strain, a sprain and some fluid there, then that's a different story. But, but be, you know, be aware of, you know, a rheumatoid patient that had, that presents with a stage one, because it can be very, very aggressive. I've seen someone actually come in with a rupture of the posterior tib, you know, in that kind oh, of wow. patient. Yeah. Okay. So, so just be on the lookout. Stage two, this is probably one of the ones you most commonly see in the office and, and the patient you were describing where you have posterior tibial tendonitis and you're beginning to develop that deformity. Um, but the, the hind foot supple, so you're able to passively correct it. Stage three is uh, when it becomes um, rigid and you're unable to correct it. And then stage four was you know, added after this original paper, but what that does, is it looks at the ankle because as the hind foot goes into valgus, 
what we know is that as a heel goes into valgus, it actually changes the, the pressure throughout the joint and lateralizes the pressure in the joint and it can result in um, some valgus ankle arthritis, which is, you know, that, that that's a bad, bad apple. That's a hard thing to correct. Yeah, that's rough. And, that, and this is a Johnson and Strom classification. Correct. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Yes. And again, stage four, that's when we have our ankle arthritis. Stage one is kind of a tendonitis stage three that you have a rigid hind foot i don't know why i just went out of order there but stage <laughs> two um they kind of just have that that supple um supple deformity that's reducible so we spoke a little bit about how this kind of helps guide treatment so which you know what what patients are undergoing non-operative treatment and then what is your non-operative treatment you know algorithm sure so my most, again, the, is starting first with the, the more supple, um, you know, tendinopathy patient that's come in without any previous treatment. Um, what I usually do for them, it, it depends how angry it is. Some people have been dealing with this for years and years and it's sore and other people come in super inflamed and they can't even walk downstairs. So I think they're a, a little bit different how you manage it because one is going to tolerate physical therapy much better than the other. But what I tend to do um, is I start them with physical therapy. Um, there's this nice break that we have in our office um, that's actually made for um, posterior tibial tendon insufficiency. It's called an airlift brace and there's an air bladder in the arch and you can pump it up and it actually helps correct the deformity. So it's essentially, it's a really strong orthotic. But mm -hmm. any sort of bracing, I think you know my, my stage one um, is gonna be a brace and physical therapy, see them in six weeks and see how they're doing. And most of the time people come to me and they'll be better. Um, you know, I don't expect them to be at zero, but they'll tell me they're 40, 50% better. And then we just kind of continue on with that as long as they're making progress. And is therapy, you know, are you writing a prescription just post your tibialis strengthening and gait training or what, what is it? What, are, what do you yeah, write? So exactly. So I have them doing, um, you know, exactly posterior tibial tendon strengthening um there's actually a really great paper um you know it's uh, by alvarez and so sometimes i'll even give them the paper and tell them to do the alvarez protocol which has been very successful that study specifically talks about using an afo brace so we kind of modify it a little bit um since most of them you know aren't in an afo at that time but i found that posterior tib strengthening um you know has been pretty successful uh in these patients Okay. And you said you give them the brace that is in full and gives them that medial support. Yeah. And I mean, that's a nice one that we have, obviously not everyone's going to okay. have it. Um, right. But just any sort of ASO and ankle stabilizing brace, you know, any of those lace up braces, I think are helpful for the, the early stages. You know, I think uh, an orthotic can be helpful more for maintenance. Um, you know, again, I, I find that people are usually coming to you because they've had a flare. You know, some people have been dealing with it forever, but for whatever reason, the pain's gotten worse. And so I try to calm them down with a little bit more um, restriction in their motion and the physical therapy. And then more long-term, I find that orthotics can be helpful more as a maintenance. Um, okay. You know, and the challenging thing and things that you don't realize as a resident is that most orthotics are not covered by insurance. And so people have to drop four or $500 on them. And that can be hard for people to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, I, I've, I've found out, I think my mom had to get some and she was like, it's a couple hundred dollars. I was like, Hey man, it's crazy. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So at first it's, you know, what's kind of that uh, lace up ankle brace kind of help calm things down and get them in some therapy and then possibly, you know, some orthotics later on down the line to help with uh, maintenance. So, and that is our non-op treatment. Those are kind of those stage right. one patients. So which patients are undergoing, you know, operative treatment? And then I guess in particular, when I was reading upon it, I guess the first, or one of the things is, you know, a tenosynovectomy, um, but in, in your experience with patients get those and what are some operative indications for- Yeah, and, and I think that, again, I don't see many of those patients because I think by the time they get to you, they've already started collapsing or they've already had some baseline collapse and then they just kind of kept progressing. So, you know, I don't see this patient that often, um, you know, if you'll come in with isolated posterior tibial tendonitis and otherwise normal alignment, it tends to be more of an acute injury, kind of like a strain or sprain. And if you have to, you boot them and send them to PT and they tend to recover. So I can't say that I've done many of these. Um, 
again, the person for me that it's an indication is, is that what we talked about, you know, that rheumatoid patient, I had a JRA patient who came in with this horribly inflamed posterior tib um, with just a ton of fluid around on the MRI. And, and for that person, um, you know, the, the synovectomy was, was successful. Um, you know, going back to non-operative treatment, what's interesting, you know, is that we've actually started to do some um, injections under um, ultrasound guidance on these. And we're, you know, collecting all of our data now. We have not seen any ruptures. Um, we've seen, you know, some people still end up with uh, surgery, but I find that that's, you know, and I still try all that standard stuff first, but I think that that's a reasonable option, especially for an older patient, who may not be able to do the surgery or for this, you know, otherwise normal alignment that just for whatever reason had this flare of tendonitis, you know, and, and that's not, you know, necessarily standard, but, you know, there are studies coming out. They recently did one on the, on the perineal uh, tendons showing that there were no ruptures. So I think if you do it the right way um, and you do it under guidance, um, I think it's a, a pretty safe thing. And I've had some success with that. Are you just doing a mixture of, you know, some st like Depomedrol and lidocaine or something mm -hmm. like that into the tendency? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. And I, I don't do it. My partner, um, who's sports medicine trained, who has a lot of background in ultrasound, um, is the one that that does all those. Oh, well, that's neat. I don't think I have seen one of those injections yet in clinic. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I just need to go to more clinics. Yeah, I mean, yeah, everyone's concerned, right? I mean, everyone's worried about ruptures, which is super, you know, totally understandable. And that's why we stay away from them, the Achilles. But, you know, I think it's, as we find more data, and I think it's a, a, an alternative to consider, especially in people who may not be good candidates. Yeah, perfect. So for the tenosynovectomies, not too many patients are mm -hmm. the ones that are indicated for that, but that is, you know, a possible option. Now, a lot of things we hear, they talk about are the calcaneal osteotomies. And I was going to see if you can kind of explain what this is and, and, and why or slash how it works. And then in what right. patients do you do this in? Right. And so I, I think that the, the real key to understanding, you know, we have a huge bag of options, you know, at a you know, we have the calc slide, we have the lateral column lengthening, we have all these things that we can do. And I, I think you know, the way I try to explain it to our residents is break it down to what the deformity is, because not all flat feet are the same. And so, you know, that first thing we're looking at when we're talking about examining that patient um, from behind is we're looking at their hind foot valgus. And so a calcaneal osteotomy really is to correct that plane of deformity. And so what it is, is like we were saying is that, that, that heel, you know, ends up being lateral to the center of the joint. And so what we do is it's an incision from the lateral side and we essentially slide it over in order to realign the heel underneath the tibia. Right. Okay. And uh, do you just use, I guess, otherwise, um, do you just use partially threaded screws to secure it in place afterwards? Yeah. Yep. So Any, I use a single mm -hmm. screw. Okay. But, you know, I use a single, you know, six or uh, excuse me, single seven O screws. Some people use two smaller screws because they feel that it causes less prominence. I usually use a headless one because I feel like, you know, I haven't really had too many issues as far as um, pain over the, the screw head. Do you hold it in place with a K wire or anything while you put that screw in or do you just put, just yeah. put this? Yeah. In? So what I do is I translate it over. I'll throw the a wire for where I think my screw is going to go. And then I'll throw a second wire just to hold the reduction um, and more of a derotation. And then after I put my screw in, I'll just pull out that second wire. Yeah, makes sense. And does the hind foot being rigid or correctable have anything to do with whether or not they get a calc osteotomy? Yes. Thank you. So this is specifically for that stage two uh, Johnson Strom classification, right? So this is for the supple hind foot. So this is somebody that has posterior tibial tendon insufficiency with a correctable foot. Okay. And so I know we, you mentioned later, I guess we can talk about lateral column lengthening. Are there any, you know, any indications that you would use um, that you do lateral column? I haven't seen one, at least for yeah. adult flat foot, but do you, do you do these? And then if so, so in what patients? Yeah. 
So the classic tested answer for this is that we're talking about that four foot abduction that Taylor uncovered. So if you have more than 35%, uh, some say 30, 30 to 35% Taylor uncovered, then this is the indication in order to correct the, the hind foot and in order to just kind of swing that forefoot around. So, you know, you have to be careful with this. And this is one of those things that I don't do it that often, mostly because everyone I trained with says people have lateral foot pain afterwards, don't do it. So I never yeah. felt the need to test that. Um, and so <laughs> I don't do a lot of these. Um, I do them more in younger people. You know, I've had actually had a couple of patients who had the surgery done on one side and their surgeon left and they want it on the other side and they love it. So I'm like, well, it's hard to argue with that. Um, yeah. And so I did the same and they did well with it. You know, I think the things you have to be careful about is you definitely don't want to overcorrect. You know, we talk about anything over, you know, eight millimeters max of 10 is probably going to cause some lateral foot pain. So you'd ra you know, almost rather undercorrect them um, than get them to neutral just because you worry about what we call lateral column overload. Yeah, that's that's pretty much everything I read about it too. They're saying you'll increase, you know, incidence of that lateral sided pain. And I would really quickly just wanted to rewind and for the calc osteotomies, why is it important that the hind foot be, you know, correctable in order right. to do the osteotomy? Right. So if you think about the thing that patients are coming to you for most of the time, right, is medial pain. They're not coming because their foot's flat. They're coming because it hurts. And so the number one thing you have to do is fix the tendon, either cut it out, however you're going to do that. I tend to, I do an FTL transfer almost all the time. And I usually cut out the posterior tibial tendon. You know, my theory on that is that that's what hurts. Um, and there's no way you're gonna be able to tension both tendons in such a way that they're both going to function at the same time. So I get rid of it. There are a lot of people that will keep it depending on what it looks like. But if the problem with the FDL, while it's the, the good things about it is that it's close by, thank you. Um, it's, it's, it's close to the posterior tip. So you don't have to go too far. It is on the same side of the neurovascular bundle. So that's the argument to doing the FDL versus the FHL, which has to cross the neurovascular bundle. Um, but the, the downside to it is it's a third of the size and a third of the strength. And so doing that in isolation is not going to be enough to support the arch. And so the, all of these osteotomies that we're doing is to support the, the FDL transfer, which is really the part that's, that's managing the pain. Mm, okay. And FDL, you kind of just go take it and, uh, and tag it. And then do you do the, do you drill it through the navicular and suture it on top or what do you, how, I guess, technically yeah. how do you typically do? So a couple of different ways you can do it. You know, I, I, uh, pretty much will. So I have already exposed the posterior tibial tendon. So I make an incision essentially just proximal to the medial mal down to the plantar aspect of the, um, it almost goes down to the first TMT joint over to get the length that you want or that I want at least on the FDL. So when I, what I do is I just open up the posterior aspect of the posterior tibial tendon sheath at the medial mal, and you see the FDL right there, and then you can just follow it down into the arch. Um, so what I do is I release it. You know, I find the, the knot of Henry, make sure I know which one's the FHL and which is the FDL, and then I'm cutting the correct one. Um, and then what I do is I, I drill uh, from dorsal to plantar um, on the navicular, and I pass the tendon from plantar to dorsal, um, and then I, I secure it with an interference screw, and then some stitches kind of where it where it enters into the tunnel and where it exits. Okay, cool. I like it. And one more thing is, what patients are getting an arthrodesis, and are they getting a triple arthrodesis when you give? And and what is a triple arthrodesis? Yes. So a triple arthrodesis is a fusion of three joints, the subtalar joint, the talonavicular joint, and the uh, calcaneocuboid joint. And, and the reason we do all three is that, again, there's multiple planes of deformity. So when you correct the subtalar joint, then you're correcting the hind foot valgus. But what can happen is that the forefoot can still be supinated, um, which we talked about was that kind of secondary deformity. And so you derotate that through the uh, transverse tarsal joint. So I do a triple arthrodesis. There are a lot of people that just do a double 
arthrodesis and just fuse the subtalar and the tail navicular joint and leave the CC joint free. Um, really no data saying that either one of them is better. In fact, if you think about it, we are talking about that very abducted foot. So if you correct that, what often happens is that the lateral CC joint gaps a lot. So, you know, if you're worried about non-union because there's a big gap there, then you can just kind of let it go and then you don't have to worry about that. Right. Okay. And what patients are you going to do a triple arthrodesis on? Yeah. So classic patient is that rigid, um, the, the rigid stage three flat foot is, is really the most important one. You know, I have some patients who are older who come in with primarily lateral sided pain. And I, I honestly think that this is such a good surgery. There are some people that are older, you know, lower demand um, that I actually recommend this surgery over that big soft tissue correction. Um, you know, and the reason is, is, you know, our outcomes show that while the soft tissue stuff does well for pain, it doesn't do great at um, radiographic changes. So if I'm worried about lateral impingement, uh, or if that's really the number one pain, again, it, it, this kind of patient population that's a little older and a little more sedentary, I think they're just, just a little more reliable to help their pain. Um, and, and it's really a, a great surgery um, for, for those people. Yeah. Okay. And for this, do you just do tool like dual incisions, one medially, one laterally, and then yeah. just kind yep. of just go down, scrape out the joint. E exactly. any um, tips or tricks for those that are that may be doing an arthrodesis coming up that you can think of? <laughs> so you know, I mean, I think the key to all these fusions is really just spending the time preparing the joints well. Um, you know, the tricky part, you know, is that. Usually you get the subtalar joint well corrected, you get the TN joint corrected, and then that CC joint just never seems to line up quite right. So it can be challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes in different ways to fix it. Um, some people do, most people do a screw across the subtalar joint. Um, some people do two screws on the TN joint, some do a plate and screw. Um, CC, you know, I've kind of morphed into a staple. I used to do a screw, I used to do a, a long 7 0 screw. So there's so many different ways. Um, to fix them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've noted that and um, just looking at different x-rays and stuff. And for your joint preparation, do you just typically just use like a burr and a curette, you know, just, just normal stuff to, to yeah. help you or any anything else? Yeah, I usually use a chisel um, okay. to, to scrape it off. You no, know, I, I prefer that over the board, just I worry about a little bit of the necrosis just because of the heat. That being said, mm. I know plenty of people that do it and, and they do great. So I, I think whatever your, you know, modality is, I, I usually do, cure, you know, I usually do uh, chisels or osteotomes for the stuff I can see well, curettes for some of those smaller kind of crannies in the back. Um, and then just a lot of irrigation um, and, you know, a lot of chiseling, drilling, whatever you want to do in order to, to really get down to that bleeding bone. Okay. And it kind of just to kind of summarize a little bit about it is, is, you know, for the stage two or those, those flexible deformities, at least I've seen most of the time people do a medial displacing calcaneal osteotomy with an FDL tendon transfer, like you were saying, um, are there any, are there any cases where, you know, you do all three, like you do the medial and then you do the lateral column lengthening and you do an FDL tendon transfer? Like, th are there any factors that play into that part? Yeah. So, I mean, there are some people that, that I will do that again, if it's more of that um, abduction deformity, again, I, I tend to be more aggressive at doing the lateral columns in younger people. So I'd say really under 30, I, I do more of those. Um, you know, for that, that more abduction uh, deformity. So I do, I do that in really severe cases. Um, I would say that my kind of go-to, the one that I do most commonly is going to be the calc slide, um, the FDL transfer. Almost all of these come with a gas rock, right? Just like we talked about with the, the exam, um, that almost every single one of them is going to have a gas rock contracture. Um, and then the other thing that I'll often add is a cut in osteotomy. And okay. that um, indication is really, so after you've done the calc slide, after you've corrected it, you want to check that forefoot. And if that forefoot's still supinated, then you'll have to do the cotton osteotomy, which is, you know, a, an osteotomy through the medial cuneiform. 
and so i haven't i haven't heard of that but is so is that a closing is that like a it's, white biplanar osteotomy so or? it's an opening wedge osteotomy dorsally um through okay. the medial cuneiform so the idea is you know again if that if that hind foot's been invalgus for so long that the forefoot has corrected by supinating what happens is you know, and if you're on foot and ankle, next time you see a patient with this, really check it. So correct that hind foot and see what happens to the forefoot. And you'll see a lot of times the forefoot's like at an angle, the big toes pointing up towards the sky. And you know that if you correct that hind foot, then they're gonna be walking on the lateral border of their forefoot. So you have to bring the medial column down in order to restore that tripod, right? Where you have, you know, the weight in the heel, weight in the fifth and weight in the first metatarsal head. Love it. That was going to be kind of the next question I asked. Uh, well, Dr. Gany, I think this has been a great episode. I think we covered all of the, or at least a good amount of all the high points, at least that I can think of off the top of my head. Is there anything else, you know, that you want people listening to, I guess, take away or, you know, one main point you want to at least take away and not forget about yeah. when you're dealing with patients that have flat foot? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the important thing, you know, really is understanding their goals um, because, this is a long recovery, you know, even, you know, patients that, and I tell them, you'll be happy you did it in a year, but it's going to take a year to get there. And so you really have to understand what their goals are. There are a lot of people that just want to walk comfortably and they'll be happy in a brace and they'll be happy, you know, doing PT on and off for the rest of their life. And they just want to be able to, to walk their dog. And there are other people that, that have higher expectations, but, but I think the important thing is, is that again, it's a, a good surgery in the right patient. Um, but they have to have reasonable expectations that it's going to take some time. They, you know, if you're doing a soft tissue correction, they're not going to have a normal looking foot. Um, and so, you know, I just it explains them your pain is going to be better, but your foot may never is probably never going to look normal. Um, and, and it's just about, you know, as everything we do, right. Because the right expectations. Yeah, very true. And I think that is a, a key part. Uh, that you pick up with time on the art of learning how to be a doctor and managing patient <laughs> expectations and, you know, making patients, you know, satisfied and happy. Um, well, Dr. Ganey, I think it's been, again, a great podcast. Uh, we always, you know, ask our guests at the end, if there's any way or anything you want to shout out about yourself or, or social media, you want people to follow you on or email or any way that you like our <laughs> listeners to follow you you can go ahead and, and and let it be known if you like if not that's fine as well yeah so i am on twitter um at lauren ganey and you know please feel free uh to email me anytime whether you're a resident whether you're a student um and the program director so love to talk to students who are interested um or having questions or anything i can do to help you um this is the best specialty there is um <laughs> and <laughs> i'm sure you'll agree um, and whatever we can do to, to help, we, we love to do, we love to teach That's why we do it. So my email is L-A-G-E-A-N-E-Y at U-C-H-C, that's UConn Health Center, uh, dot edu. So please reach out. Happy to hear from you. Oh, well, again, Dr. Ganey, great podcast. Thank you so much. And for all the listeners, thank you again for listening to yet another episode of the Nailed It Ortho podcast. Please go ahead and subscribe and leave a review and let us know how much you enjoyed our episode talking about Flatfoot with Dr. Ganey. And until next time. Thank you.